सत्सरमणीयदर्शन मंदहासुचिराननाबुज पूजित सुरनरोतमेर्मुदा धर्मनंदनम विचित धर्मनंदनम विचित श्रीगण श्याम महाराज निज ऑल माइट इज सुप्रीम लॉर्ड और बिलोट गण श्याम महाराज पूज्य गुरु जी पूज्य भगत जी एंड ऑल ऑफ ड्यूटीज जय स्वामी नारायण सपोज यू आर एट इन अर्ली मॉर्निंग यू आर ऑन टेबल फॉर ब्रेकफास्ट नाउ सीरियल एंड मिल्क इज रेडी फॉर यू एवरी थिंग इज रेडी यू आर ऑल्सो रेडी एंड यू आर जस्ट टायर टू इट but before that when you have a cup of milk in your hand your brother stop you he say this is not a proper milk instead of sugar i have add in salt now the milk is the milk but instead of sugar you have add in milk a salt now the question is that would you now drink the milk or not definitely not because you did not like to drink a salty milk now the second question if you are in the mall and uh as a christmas gift or as your birthday gift your parents offer you to buy any clothes what you like you select your favorite colored shirt suppose your favorite color is blue and you select a sky blue t-shirt now when you are come back with your with it with this t-shirt in your home and when you unwrap the t-shirt and you saw a uh, one of black spot unnecessary spot on front of front side of the t-shirt now would you wear it or would you return it definitely return it in the same way meaning you do not accept such things which you don't like in the same way when we offer devotion any kind of devotion there are nine types of devotion we have earlier discussed about it and when you offer devotion meaning bhakti to bhagwan bhagwan also just as you d- do not like a salty milk to drink in the same way bhagwan also want to drink a pure milk drink a milk which is not have salt in it in the same way if we doing bhakti but if we have some selfish motives or some kind of ego then our egoistic devotion bhagwan never accept this is the point we are going to discuss today ego is very dangerous enemy just as a salt not match in milk just unnecessary black spot on the t-shirt is not like for anybody in the same way if we have a kind of ego in our heart when we perform bhakti to bhagwan then bhagwan never accept our devotion for that in the vachanavrut bhagwan gives many examples bhagwan used to give an example of a gold when there is 24 karat gold but if some impurity is added into the gold the gold remain 22 carats if more impurities meaning a silver or copper add into the gold then it will become 18 carats or even th- less than that in the same way 
the quantity of egotism the quantity of our ego adding to our devotion our devotion did not remain as 100% pure and perfect devotion and when ego add into our devotion or the intensity or the capacity to please bhagwan of our devotion definitely will be reduced and bhagwan always like to a pure devotion now what is the measurement of pure purity suppose you want to describe your white shirt you definitely say this my shirt is as white as a milk sometimes some people may compare the white color t-shirt as uh, with a color of swan but still some impurities some yellow shades remain in swan and therefore the only milk is that which which is the perfect for describing the white color meaning the purity of white color if you compare white color with a moon still some black spot in the moon in the same way bhagwan also expect from us a pure devotion as a pure milk if anything in the milk we add even some cardamom or some pieces of cashew nut or almonds anything still it will definitely remain different from the milk in the same way if we if we are doing bhakti of bhagwan with our egoistic nature then that will definitely remain aloof from devotion now there are so many devotees at the time of bhagwan swami narayan as well as today just as we consider our own self we are known as the duty of bhagwan swami narayan but still many times we are doing his bhakti we many times perform devotion to bhagwan with a ego- egoistic nature sometimes we are doing uh, many many downward meaning prostration before bhagwan only for showing others not pleasing bhagwan sometimes a devotee who is chanting bhagwan's name many thousand times in a day but that's only to show other not to please bhagwan our nature should be like that we have to gaze our eyes gaze our target only on to please bhagwan not to show others our devotion is not meant for others we are only doing devotion we are only doing bhajan or bhakti only to please bhagwan and his santo now if we have ego in our heart then what happen just take an example an eagle it could always raise on a very high altitude like 30000 feet above in comparison eagle a crow it has no such capacity to fly in the sky very high altitude like that of a, that of an eagle eagle has no ego in his mind instead his uh, even though he it it was flying very high altitude in the sky still it has no ego on the other hand a crow crow has an ego in his heart that's why it cannot fly more above in the sky and whenever he find out a little birds on the tree or on the ground crow definitely come near to that bird and definitely tease him sometimes even it kills another bird or offerings of the birds this is the nature of crow because it has an ego in his in its mind that i am a bigger than the smaller 
I can eat the others. It has a feeling of I-ness. In the same way, if we want to fly in the spiritual sky on the way to Aksardham, then we have to forget ego from our heart. We have to remove it. Then and then we can fly in the sky of religion just like an eagle fly in the sky without any disturbance. Eagle can come down only for its food, not meant for any other purpose. In the same way, a, a person, a devotee who has no ego in his heart, he never come down. He only come down for the propitiation of Bhagwan and his santo, for following Bhagwan's and his santo's agnya commands, but not for other men. On the other hand, a crow it has an ego in his heart, and that's why, without any reason, it definitely come down for pleasing its egoistic nature. <coughs> To satisfying its egoistic nature but there is no any other reason in the same way in our religion devotees those who has egoistic nature even doing devotion then such devotees definitely come down by their behavior they are always busy in showing their nature to others they are always busy to show their own ability, whether they are performing daily or not. But if once they perform by chance any rituals more than the others, then they definitely show others that I have this ability, I have this capacity. On the other hand, a devotee is like an eagle. They always remain silent. They are always busy in flying on their way. They are always flying on high altitude, in, on such an altitude there is no disturbances. Just like an aeroplane, plane is always fly on very high altitude in the sky, be only because there are uh, very little or no and disturbance of even weather. In the same way, if we want to save our journey from here to Aksardam, we have to fly on high altitude because there is little or no disturbance on that way. And for that we have to remove ego from our heart. Because Bhagwan never like an egoistic person. Many many, many other vices also generated from this ego. That's why we have to turn ego from our heart. And Bhagwan gave an example of a dog for describing the term of egotism. Bhagwan Swaminarayan himself said in the 41th Vachanamrita of Gurda 2nd chapter, the nature of a person, however, is such that he only enjoys doing that which satisfies his ego. Whether a person eats, drinks, walks, or doing anything, he is always busy in doing or satisfying his nature of ego. Without that, he does not enjoy performing even bhakti of God. For example, a dog takes a dry bun to an isolated place to chew on. As a result of the chewing, its mouth is abraded and the bone becomes covered in blood. Then, licking the bone, the dog becomes overjoyed. But little does the fool realize the taste that I am enjoying is that of the blood from my own mouth. In the same way, even a devotee of God is unable to forsake the ego in the form of forsake the bond in the form of egotism. In fact, all of the spiritual endeavors he performs are governed by ego. They are not performed for the sole purpose of pleasing God, thinking of them as bhakti towards God. Moreover, 
even of the bhakti that he does offer to god he does so only when it nourishes his pride but not for the sole purpose of pleasing god this is what bhagwan says in the vachanamrut a dog has a nature to eat anything which is on the way that is its nature so once upon a time a dog is passing by a street and there he found a bone of another animal now it uh, the dog thinking in, in in its mind that this may be a uh, something to eat and that's why he without any delay he pick up that bone in its mouth and take it to an isolated place there he try to chew it but as the bone is very hard dog cannot chew it and the, instead of chewing instead of making any pieces of the bone dog dog's mouth injure some of it gums damage and some blur come out from it, its mouth then the dog realize that this blur is come from this bone and then dog is licking that blood but after some time he realized that this is not the blood from this bone but this is my own blood this is because my mouth is injured and the blood come out from my mouth and this is the same blood i licking from last 10 minutes in the same way bhagwan says here an egoistic person he always performing every activity in the mandir only to show others but not to please bhagwan and finally when there is there is uh, when the time is over or just near to over then at that time such devotees realize that i have wasted my time to show others to please others not bhagwan and i am doing bhakti of bhagwan to please him not to show others but at the time he has no any chance the time is wasted for example just uh for uh, for understanding how this egoistic nature obstruct us in our religion in our religious path at the time of bhagwan swami nar early akhachar he was a very staunch devotee now even though he was remaining householder state of devotion still he used to do kyun discourses to others and by preaching the rules and regulations of bhagwan swami nar and the glory of bhagwan swami nar he had make 18 other devotees a sant but still when if he he has an ego in his heart then whenever the situation is occur muktanand swami did not give his name as a great devotee of our satsang fellowship then he became ready to even cut up muktanand swami's head this is what egoistic nature harm us in our religious life in the same way if we cannot success to remove ego from our heart and if we continue doing bhakti in the satsang with egoistic nature one day that will be that will become very very dangerous for our religious life this is the most dangerous enemy of our own that's why we have to remove ego from our heart because just as you do not like to drink salty milk in the same way bhagwan is not ready to accept our egoistic devotion that's why if we want to please bhagwan and our beloved guruji we have to remove ego from our heart and when we rem- when we able to remove ego from our heart 
भगवान एंड और गुरु जी विल बी प्लीज अपॉन अस एंड दे विल ग्रेस सो सो दैट वी कैन ऑफर भगवान अ प्योर डिवोशन लाइक अ प्योर मिल्क बाय सेइंग दिस जय स्वामीनारायण श्री घनश्याम महाराज नी जय प्रभु तव मूर्ति विनोदकारी पलपन विसरे नहीं जो विसारी जुगल चरण सोल चिन्ह जेह नजर समीप रहो अमारिये घनश्याम महाराज निज स्वामी नारायण भगवान निज सुप्रीम ऑल माई री और बुलावेर घनश्याम महाराज Our divine Pujapad Guruji, Pujya Santo, all of you devotees, my Jai Swami Narayan. Fear, something that we experience on a daily basis, yet we can't escape from the fear. Many people have many different fears, but. I still can't find a person who says he's fearless of everything and anything. Fear is something that goes along with phobias. What do I mean by that? Well, first and foremost, a phobia is a persistent irrational fear of a specific object, activity or situation that lead to a compelling desire. to avoid it do you have any f- kind of phobias in your life i think when i go more in detail you'll find out the human entity has fear of many things living and non-living depending on the person but just think how many phobias or what kind of phobias do we have I just want to name a couple of phobias so you can understand the subject better. If someone fears spiders, it's called arachnophobia. If you fear heights, meaning if you're on if you go to a skyscraper and you go to the 100th floor and you look down and you're very fearful of heights, you can't even stand being there. It's called acrophobia. If you have fear of situations in which escape is difficult, it's called arogophobia. You know, sometimes your neighbors have pet animals. The most common pet animal is a dog. If you can't stand that dog, that means you have fear of dogs, which is called cynophobia. What about on that night when you're sleeping? and thunder and lightning wakes you up you become frightened not because of the dream you're having but because of that thunder and lightning sound well it's called astrophobia these are just your common phobias there's also called something like social phobia which where you can't avoid or you try to avoid events places people 
that trigger anxiety or attack. And something very, very, you can say, minute, but many people have it. It's called mysophobia, and it's a fear of germs or dirt. But there's one phobia which probably 99% of the population of the world has, and it's called thanatophobia. Thanatophobia, what is that? It's a fear of death. Death is something that is very common to us, something that we experience not personally, but at least we hear from one of our friends or our neighbors or even our relatives or someone who's working with you, our coworker, that one of their relatives or one of their close family members has died. Something that you listen to and you hear and after listening to it, you just think, poor guy, of course. But then you kind of forget about it, thinking that it's never going to happen to you. But most people think that death is common, death is known, but it's something that's not going to happen to them any time in the future. So they're not afraid of it as of right now. But they are afraid of dying. Many people want to live forever, but something that is not in your hands, you can say. Thanatophobia, or the fear of death, is a rel relatively complicated phobia. Many of most people are afraid of dying. Some people fear being dead, while others are afraid of the actual act of dying. However, if the fear is so prevalent as to affect your daily life, then you might have a full-blown phobia. I Meaning if you can't stand death, even listening to it, or even someone else talking about it, then you have this phobia. Now, going back to the meaning of this word, it's a persistent irrational fear. Fear is our topic. You're probably wondering, I, I just named you a couple of things that are fearful, you might be fearful of, like suppose closed spaces, or dogs, or thunder or lightning, or even germs or dirt. But what is the difference between a common fear versus a phobia? Well, after doing some research, I found some examples that's going to help you ease the topic a little bit. Here's a normal fear. Feeling anxious when flying through turbulence or taking off during a storm. It's very common. The phobia side is not going to your best friend's island wedding because you had to fly there, meaning completely avoiding the situation of flying. You'd rather take a, sh a boat or you'd rather just not go. Second fear, experiencing butterflies when peering down from the top of a skyscraper or climbing a tall ladder, meaning heights. The phobia side, turning down a great job because it's on the 10th floor of the office building. Meaning, even for money, those who have phobias cannot stand or cannot even think of the thought of going on a 10th floor of an office building to work there every day because that person has a phobia of heights. Moving on, third fear, getting nervous when you see a pit bull or a Rottweiler, meaning these are types of dogs. Seeing them makes you nervous, obviously anyone, because you're afraid they might bite you or attack you. The phobia side, steering clear of the park because you might see a dog. Just completely avoiding any kind of situation that you might have to encounter any of these particular, you can say, subjects, that's called a phobia. If you don't understand, I got one more example for you feeling a little queasy when getting a shot or when you when, or when your blood is being drawn meaning injections the phobia side avoiding necessary medical treatments or doctors checkups because you're terrified of needles obviously your health is something that needs to be checked but because you fear needles or because you have the phobia of needles you completely avoid even medical checkups i think you probably get gist of this whole subject, fear versus phobia. 
probably wondering again, what is the reason that I'm talking about this subject, fear? What does that have to do with anything? But out of all these phobias that I've named, or out of all the phobias there are in the world that are discovered so far, 99% of the human population has thanatophobia, meaning the fear of death. This is something that can't be cured from any kind of medical, you can say, treatment or any kind of scientific, you can say, cures. It's not something that can be cured by if you just go to your local Walgreens or if you go to your local doctors and he writes you a prescription and gives you something that, oh, just take this medicine, you'll be free of the fear of death. No, it doesn't work like that. Maybe others might, or maybe others, they might hypnotize you. There are techniques to cure these phobias, and one of the techniques is hypnotism. If, you, if, you're, hypnot if, if you're hypnotized, then through that hypnotism, you completely, your, your mind is kind of blocked off from that image. Suppose that you can't stand needles, and you go to a psychiatrist or someone that can pretty much cure this phobia, and they hypnotize you. And through that hypnotism, it's completely like you don't have that memory part that you're fearful or you have the phobia of needles. So then you can go to the doctors, you can get your blood drawn, you can even, you would probably think about even donating your blood from a head. So that's just a common treatment. But what about this one? The real tough one, which is the fear of death. How can that be cured? Well, there's only one way, and that way is Sriji Maharaj's way. According to the Vachnamrut, Sriji Maharaj is the doctor, and the Vachnamrut is the prescription. According to the Vachnamrut Loya second chapter, Maharaj has actually given us the answer here, meaning using spiritual terms, using something that's not scientific, but something that's spiritual will definitely free one from the fear of death. So first I'm going to read that question and then we'll analyze Sri Maharaj's answer. Swami Narayan Hare In this satsang, when does a devotee become free from the fear of death and become convinced of his own liberation in this very life? Question is simple. How can one become free from the fear of death? And how could one be completely convinced? Meaning, how can one just know without a doubt that my liberation is guaranteed? Meaning, after when I leave this body, I'll definitely attain Akshardham. How could this be known? What is the way? What is the cure, as you can say? Sri Maharaj answers, In my mind, I feel that there are four types of devotees of God who no longer fear death and who feel completely fulfilled. These four types of devotees are first, number one, the one who has faith. Number two, the one who has gnan, meaning knowledge. Number three, the one who has courage. And number four, the one who has affection. These four devotees are completely or become completely free from the fear of death. The four types of devotees do not fear death no longer, and they feel fulfilled while still alive. In the time of Sriji Maharaj, there is a great saint by the name of Akarnanan Swami. Many times, Sriji Maharaj, what he did was, he used to send his santos to do vichran in many, many different areas of Gujarat. And there, many santos would do vichran and would do satsang to devotees. On Sri Maharaj's assignment, Akarnan Swami was on the task of doing vichran. Now, just to give a brief bio or biography of Swami, how he was, I'd like to tell you that he was probably one of the most elite saints of Sri Maharaj because of his prominent spiritual you can say level. He was completely engrossed in the idol of Maharaj and did not remember or did not know 
or did not even have any kind of, you can say, presence of anything but Maharaj. Wherever Maharaj took him, he went. So, while he was deeply engrossed in the form of Sriji Maharaj, he was traveling in the forest and it became dark. It was a dense forest and not even the sunlight could penetrate the canopy. That's how dense it was. At that time, while Swami was walking, Swami didn't even know where he was, but while he was just walking where, wherever Maharaj was taking him, four lions encountered him. Now, let's just stop and think. If we were in the forest, and even if we saw a snake, I'm not even going to go with lions, because that's something that is beyond our capacity, but something that's a little more diluted. If we encountered a snake, let's say a king cobra, we know it's venomous and it's only 10 feet away from us, what would we do? Run away. It's very simple. Even if you know that that snake might catch up to you and bite you in the back of your leg, you still would run. But let's listen to what Swami did. Right there, when those four lions encountered him, Swami stopped. He thought in his mind that it's my great fortune that these four lions have encountered me. Why? Who would say this, first of all? Because, first and foremost, Bhagwan is the all-doer. He is Sarvakarta. So, regarding that point, Swami said that I would make food for these lions. These lions are very hungry and they're looking for food. And my body can be provided as food. So, I have no fear. Out of the four devotees, Swami's category would probably fall under gnan or knowledge. Swami had knowledge that he was a soul. He was not the body. So even if he knew this body would be destroyed or teared apart, teared apart from these lions, he knew that his soul would be untouched or remain intact because he knew and he had the knowledge that the soul is full of light. The soul is full of knowledge and there is nothing that can disturb it. It's a constant. So Swami thought in this mind like this and the lion started coming closer and closer to Swami. Swami stood firm and with this thought he stood straight there just looking in the eyes of each and every lion. Obviously Sriji Maharaj was with him and he was such a saint that Maharaj always rescued him. So. Maharaj, through his omniscient powers, prevailed in each and every one of those lions, you can say mind, and changed the thought of eating Swami. And what the lions did, miraculously, was circle around Swami, like one who does Pradakshina around a Mandir or Maharaj, in the same way, circle around Swami, and then left the scenario. Proving that Swami had won the fear of death, through gnan or knowledge. In the same particular manner, we as devotees of Bhagwan Swami Narayan have to develop at least one of these attributes in order to become free from the fear of death. This is the only cure. If you go to a medical doctor, there is nothing he can give you to cure this fear. But if you go to the medical doctor in the form of Sriji Maharaj, his Vachnamrut, his Santo, then they'll give you this, you can say, medicine, which can only ail you and which can pretty much fear or free your fear of death and you'd become completely fearless. All in all, as devotees, we have little fears because we have knowledge that Bhagwan is with us, he is rescuing us, but this fear always remains. That's why Maharaj had to include this question in the Vachnamrut for his devotees, because this is the most, you can say, fearful thing any human encounters. So by following this Vachnamrut, Loya second chapter, and by following the words of Sriji Maharaj, one can completely become fear, free, free from the fear of death. Saying this, my humble 
जय स्वामीनारायण